Hey there and good morning. Gosh, we have a job search blitz for the end of the year. If you've been holding off, looking at the holidays, wondering what to do, Thanksgiving's passing us by, now the, the other holidays are just a couple weeks ahead. Now is the perfect time actually to really get your job search in high gear. Unless you have something very well underway, it's not going to come to fruition before the turn of the, the new year. But now is the exact right time to get all of that energy in motion if you have not. And if you've already got a few things in motion, let's kick it up to another level. Today, we're going to talk about, uh, well, let me share my screen. Hang on just a second here. We'll pull that up. Ah, welcome. There we go. You know, today, we're going to talk about interviewing and all that you can do in the interview process to really uh, change the equation in your job search. Let me just check one of my other connections here. Get a nice fresh one. Much, much better. There we go. Um, a lot of, lot of things coming up. So I want you to take a look uh, at this next screen coming up here. Over the next two weeks, everything that may be challenging you in your job search, uh, in your consulting practice, maybe even in running your own small business, all of those issues from a brand perspective and how to represent yourself are all going to be handled. Hopefully, you can join in for as many sessions as possible, uh, including that Thursday NYPL session, which you do have to register for in advance, which is all about doing these same things, but for your small business. Uh, check that out. That's over on my selfrecruiter.com website, just under the uh, calendar. You can see everything there, all my dates coming up. Well, today is interview intervention, and I named it this way on purpose. Most of us need an intervention before the next time we walk through that door or click onto the Zoom meeting for that next interview, waiting to be interrogated, waiting to be questioned. That's why we need that intervention. <laughs> you know, we don't understand what the interview is about. We think we think it's a test where they're going to kick the tires. Yes, actually they are. But you also need to be kicking the tires in reverse. As much as they're checking you out, you need to be checking them out, making sure it is the right place to move your career. The other thing to think about in terms of what an interview really is, it's an interview uh, influence opportunity. This is about how you use the nuance in your communication style to influence their thoughts about you and why really you are the most important uh, person that they're going to speak with. Now, we're going to accomplish a lot of this through our personal branding. So the other lectures are coming up a little bit later this week. If you've not seen them and you're in a rush, you can certainly go over to my YouTube channel to see those as well. But your personal branding is really everything that's about you. Now, it's most on display and most important in the interview itself, but you have to prepare yourself for that interview. That means you have to think about everything that could potentially affect your brand or how they think of your brand, all those things that separate you out from others, all the qualities that you bring to the table. So we have to think in terms of that, but we have to make sure that we have that brand uniformly covered across the resume, across our LinkedIn profile, across even our cover letter and the different messaging that we may do in direct outreach. A lot of, a lot of big fan of direct outreach. We'll, we'll talk lots more about that coming up. Just understand that you have to uh, solidify your brand just like any one of these big national brands. You know, when you walk down that supermarket aisle, is there any difficulty seeing the Folgers or the Kellogg's or the Coca-Cola? Almost reach off the shelf and slap you in the face, right? You have to manage your brand the same way. Uh, understand what you bring to the table, and elevate that so it's up in the spotlight. Now, in terms of our interview itself, it's determined by how much effort we put into it. If you do not prepare in advance, you're not going to do very well because it's a sales meeting. This is where you're supposed to walk in the door, really teaching them how to select you because it's a sales meeting. You have to take control in the process, even if they try to control it themselves. You have to make your case. It is this sales meeting one more time. What it's not, even though it may feel like it, is this interrogation, this cross-examination, everything else. Just keep yourself focused on the fact that it's your job to teach them how to select you as the very, very best one. Now, here's a little bit of the trap that we get stuck in. We, we think about our competitors. We think about them as cookie cutter perfect. Oh, they're just cookie cutter perfect, all standing in line. I want to I be that. I want to be that. Really? You want to be... Cookie cutter, perfect, interchangeable? 
Because if I pick you, I'm paying you less. You don't want less? Okay, that's fine. I'll take number two, number five, doesn't really matter. I'm taking anybody in this line because they're all interchangeable to me. In your interview process, you have to position yourself as not only, of course, being interchangeable, capable, qualified, like everybody else standing in line here, but also somehow different, exceptional, special. So you're both things at once. Now, if you've not seen me before, John Krant, author, career coach, and speaker, resume and LinkedIn guru as well. So if your career is suffering from bad storytelling, bad storytelling of your career narrative across the resume, across your LinkedIn profile, even how you may tell that story um, in a submissive way in interview, I think I know who you need to work with. <laughs> All my packages are over on my self-recruited website, just under uh, the services tab. And if you need to chat before you know which one is really the right package for you, send me a quick email. We'll set up a time to chat. A few ideas that will help you. Of course, my book is a very good book available at the New York Public Library over on Amazon on my own website. Roadmap really about how to manage your job search, how to handle all the difficulties that come up in your job search, even juggling your brand itself. Now, special uh, importance is LinkedIn. All of the topics are very important, but special importance is LinkedIn. LinkedIn is really the flip side of your resume. If you think about the resume as being your calling card, oh, that's what determines the value. Well, it's now gone to, to an exponential outcome, and that's taking that story from the resume and taking it to LinkedIn. If you've not improved your LinkedIn the way you should have, uh, right on my homepage, selfrecruited.com, halfway down the page, you can see a special version of my LinkedIn lecture where you can see me large, the slides large, really use it as a start and stop tutorial as you build out a much more effective LinkedIn profile. Also on my LinkedIn, there's a few articles. Just click on those. They'll help you in all sorts of aspects of your job search. Getting back to today, this lecture and all of the lectures are about one thing. How is it I'm going to become this self-recruiter, this one great recruiter that looks over one great candidate, which is also you. So you have to be not only the great candidate, but you have to also be the manager, the cheerleader, the strategist, uh, all sorts of, of planning and everything else go for as well. You have to do everything. You have to wear a lot of different hats. Bulk of it we do through what we do on LinkedIn, exponentially changing the way we network and go after the next opportunity. A lot more of that in the LinkedIn lecture. But also, it's about keeping one eye on the toughest competitor imaginable. Those four, five, or six people that would just scare you out of even going after the job. They're like, oh, 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 they're going after the job? Forget it, forget it. That person? <laughs> yes, I know these people seem scary, but you know what they suffer from? Ego and arrogance. And they don't prepare. They're like, oh, well, they're just going to pick me. And then they don't actually do their homework. You can beat these seemingly perfect people very, very easily with a little bit of planning and, and uh, foresight and, and really understanding that's your job to teach them. Teach them that you're the right one. Also teaching them at the same time that the competitors are not the right one. You know, we'd all love to see the job, get the interview, and, and, and of course, I just get the job after that. It doesn't really work that way. Uh, most people are hitting that darn button like you are. Rarely says apply. <laughs> On occasion, on occasion, almost always says submit all capital letters till we're so submissive. It's like a Friday night waiting for that phone to ring. Leaves us in a very unhappy place. Just, well, if I submitted my resume, well, I expect a lot from you submitting your resume. So submissive. Let's get right to the decision maker. Lots and lots of discussion of that in the LinkedIn lecture. It changes the entire equation uh, when you look at the world a different way. When you get right to the decision maker and have that conversation there, I know it's scary, but it's a whole lot less scary than going through round after round after round in HR trying to filter you out, really without the right background to even judge you. I want you to change this equation of diminishing returns simply by changing these rules. These rules you never agreed to in the first place. Let's go back to the idea of this product. You are this product. Here's what not to be. Don't be mediocre. About half the workforce, pains me to say, pains me to say, about half the workforce is only mediocre. Of only, I love to read this one, of only moderate quality, ordinary, average, middling, middle of the road, uninspired, undistinguished, on and on and on and on. No great shakes, not up to much, and Bush League. You know what you have to be if the bulk of the workforce is mediocre? 
just a little tiny bit better than mediocre and you're ahead of most people. If you simply put a little heart and soul into whatever function it is you do, you will naturally be at the top one, two, three percent. That changes everything. Now, what is our story? And we have to get ready to tell our story in different formats, in different venues, in different ways. The world has changed. In person, not very likely, but yeah, might, might happen, might happen. Uh, certainly, probably as part of the overall process. Telephone interview, very, very likely to happen. Most likely, well, that's going to be a Zoom, a Meet, uh, uh, any of those technologies. We have to think about how you're going to get ready uh, to use that platform. I know this part seems shocking. Don't answer questions. <laughs> what? What? Go, into, go to my interview and don't answer questions? Yes, yes. Go to your interview. Don't answer questions unless you intend or choose to. This is about staying in control of the conversation. So we're using the device of the Q&A to really answer like a politician. I'm going to answer any question I wished I was asked rather than the question you did ask me. You asked me this question, I answer that question. You answer, ask me this question, I answer this question. Remember, I'm not trying to be evasive. I'm strategically using the question to answer and talk about the story elements of my background that will make me most valuable. Sometimes I may answer their literal question if it services me. That's what we're after. So I want you to understand that you are now in charge because it's a sales meeting. This does not mean you can be a steamroller. Oh my gosh, let them feel in charge. Let them feel in control if it makes them feel better. But I want you to have puppet master control, puppet master control as you pull the strings with questions in the way you answer. Now, to do it effectively, you're going to have to know why you are valuable in the first place and more valuable than the next five or six people that want that job. And there's a secret. You may not like this entire process. Assuming you are capable and qualified, capable and qualified, I don't hire a single person because they're capable and qualified. Please don't mishear that. I wouldn't hire anybody that I did not believe to be capable and qualified. But that's not the criteria. That's a minimum foundational benchmark. If you don't pass that level, I wouldn't even glance in your direction. So because you're capable and qualified has nothing to do with my decision. What makes you tick? Chemistry, number one, above all other things, assuming I believe you're capable and qualified. By the way, to be capable and qualified, you do not have to have held this particular job before. You just have to have developed the right experience to be capable and qualified. Then chemistry will win the day. Second behind chemistry is confidence, confidence in you. And I don't even know what I'm going to get from you, but I have a feeling if I roll the dice on you, I'm going to get something special I didn't get from somebody else. Chemistry and confidence actually determines the level of engagement, determines their interest in you. But it's much, much closer to this type of engagement really is. It's very similar to a dating process. It's the two worst things in the world mixed together. It's a sales process and a dating process at the same time. Now, it's a dating process because we want to like the people we hire. You know why? Because if I hire you, I'm going to spend my waking life with you. I'm going to spend actually more hours with you than I spend with my loved ones. That's why we want to like you. Yes, please be capable and qualified, but we want to like you because I have to spend my time with you. So don't forget when you set up how to tell your story, of course, convey you're capable and qualified, but don't leave out the why are you interesting and what makes you tick, even if it has nothing to do with your work life. You know, I was a couple, probably three years back now, I was end of October, just finishing up a client's resume LinkedIn whole renovation process. And last couple touches on the LinkedIn side, and suddenly my client goes, oh, I'm about to be a four-time marathon runner next week. I'm like, well, what? You're about to be a four-time marathon runner? This is the first time John's hearing about it? Well, that doesn't have anything to do with my career. It doesn't? You seem like you're getting a little mature to me. <laughs> four-time marathon runner, what does that convey? Energy, drive, unstoppable, goal-driven. Oh, my gosh, probably really good on my healthcare costs. They think about it all. So don't forget to sell even those personal sides of you that are the motivational sides of you. The why are you interesting? What makes you tick? Probably going to require a fundamental shift, a paradigm shift in how you've done your interviews, how you've told your story before. Wait for the question, give the answer. Wait for the question, give the answer. Really, every answer you give 
it all has to be filtered through one simple question. The essence of it has to be in every answer. And that's why is it going to be the very best business decision I'm going to make today if I choose to hire you? If you can convince me of that, there's almost nothing that will stop me from hiring you. And it comes back to here. Using our communication mastery, our soft skills, our nuance and abilities of interacting with other people to convey not only am I this capable, qualified, interchangeable person, but somehow I'm the exceptional one that you're looking for. And your soft skills or emotional intelligence quotient, all those things that fold into that or how you're going to do that. Really, to, to distill it down to its most basic, our ability to make small talk and engage others is why we're going to be hired. So practice, practice, practice. We have to do a lot of practice to make sure that we are going to win the game. Now, coming up here, I am going to teach you how to build out an entire interview plan. That's very, very important. You do have to be motivated. You have to understand what the objective is, but you also have to influence them. And if we're going to influence them, we're going to have to do a few steps that influence them. Plus, we have to have a full plan, which we're going to develop with you here today. So first thing is I would go into LinkedIn. I'm going to reverse search this company. Let's imagine I got an interview at ABC Company for next Tuesday. Whoa! <laughs> interview next Tuesday, ABC Company. Fantastic. First thing I'm going to do is go to LinkedIn, the same way I teach in my LinkedIn lectures, reverse search the company, put in a few keywords to narrow down by department, everything else. And I'm going to begin to pick 25 to 30 people that somehow would surround that job. Up, up, up the food chain, up, up, up. Don't be shy. Down, 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 all the way down to admin level for very strategic reasoning, left and right into a surrounding department or two. Nice, healthy mix of 25 to 30 people that I would likely interact with every single week once I have that job. This is your influence pool. Open their profiles, which triggers a marketing event. Talk all about that the LinkedIn side. And then suddenly this invitation to connect. Oh, it's a great background. Oh, we're looking for someone just like this. Begin to warm up the audience behind the firewall of the company. So really, this, this message, which is a copy and paste forevermore, right at one time ever, communicates the basics. You don't know me, or, or, or maybe if it's for an interview, you're about to know me, about to meet me next Tuesday. Gentle reminder. Let's, let's skip the, the 25 to 30, which is a more broad, um, you don't know me, uh, great background. I'd like to connect together. But now when you're about to meet the four or five people that you might be able to meet, then you're, you can have a gentle reminder about to meet you on Tuesday at 10 a.m. and would love to connect with you here on LinkedIn. Really, many of them won't connect with you until after they meet you, so don't take it personally. This is about tapping them on the shoulder so they are looking at your profile. Looking at your profile, absorbing your story, believing in your story before you've ever figuratively walked through that door for the interview. This gives them a little bit of a boost of you versus the competitor. Looking forward to meeting you on Tuesday. And of course, love to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn. Right away, it draws them over to your LinkedIn for a fresh look. Begins to bake and layer your information into their brain. Nudge, nudge, nudge. All of this is gentle marketing. Small changes change everything in terms of getting them to fall in love with you for this position. So let's be persuasive. Now, it's not going to really happen unless we develop an actual plan. Let me get a little coffee here. So we need to do a real plan, a real interview plan, which you have to develop every single time. And if you do it every single time, you'll get very, very good at doing it. And your interviews will become better and better and you'll get more and more offers. So let's run down this list here. We're going to have to build the agenda because it's a sales meeting. You're not there to be interrogated, even though it sometimes feels like it. Uh, we're going to have to do a needs analysis. We'll come back and tell you what that really is. We're going to have to select and customize our work life stories. That's a key piece of it. And if there's no buy sign, we can't just like, oh, they're being nice to me, but there's no buy sign. We're going to have to deal with that. We're going to have to overcome any objections. We cannot leave the conversation with any objection in place. We must counter those objections before we leave the conversation or they're not going to pick you. And at the very end, we need to close them. Sales technique, sales term. We're going to dice all this out for you and give you the detail. We're going to have to close them on why you're the very best selection, not just a good candidate, the very best selection. Get the job or, or have them uh, get the next interview or have them create that job for you. So let's kind of explode this out and figure out 
how we do each of these pieces. In terms of building the agenda, well, who am I going to meet? You need every single person's vote. So how can you get their vote? How can you plan in advance if you don't know who's going to show up to the meeting? You need to know who you're going to meet. And if you don't need, know, you got to email them. Well, I, I just emailed them this morning. Well, email them again. It's worth it. Dear Jack, in addition to yourself, can you let me know who else I'm likely, there's the word, to, to meet with next Tuesday as I'd like to fully prepare for the meeting? If you forget to include the word likely, they're going to go, oh, I'm not really sure. And you didn't get very far because you didn't think of how they were going to block you. So by including likely, then you might go, oh, I'm not really sure, but probably Jack and Jim and, and, and probably two or three of your peers. Okay, I got two more names and I got a reference to two or three of my peers. I could look up on LinkedIn, the way I showcased in the last five minutes of my LinkedIn lecture. I can reverse search all of LinkedIn and suddenly go, oh, I have six peers. Oh, I'm going to meet two or three of these people. And I have to plan on how to build chemistry with all six because I don't know which ones I'm going to meet. <laughs> how am I going to build chemistry with every single person on the list? That is uh, what we're talking about. Which career stories, which pieces of your background are right to talk about to get this person's vote or that person's vote or that person's vote? Each of them may need different stories depending on what their background is. So put your thinking cap on. Is there something that could make them jump out of their chair? What else? Do they need to hear or what else are you missing? Now, second step in the process, besides actually building an agenda, is a needs analysis. Now, what this really means in the shortest way possible is simply, please don't answer any questions at all. Even if they said, oh, John, tell me about yourself. <gasps> Asked me a question before I got to do the needs analysis. <laughs> you think I'm going to answer the question? Of course not. I'm going to sidestep the question. Oh, I'd love to answer and tell you about myself. Before I do, oh, I'd love to make sure my answers are all as focused and as valuable as possible. You know, of course, I've done my homework and preparation. Can't let them think you didn't prepare. I've read the job description. I've looked at competitors, everything else. But, you know, Jack, Jim, or Jill, I'd love to hear from your perspective or your view or your opinion. What's the most important uh, project or projects or things I need, I'll need to get control of in the first 30 to 60 days as I step into the role? Oh, my gosh. I hope you visually saw me stepping into the role because I verbally stepped into the role. Those, again, are techniques to help them get comfortable with you in the role, help them see you in the role. That's how they begin to pick you for the role. Now, the needs analysis is as simple as how could I possibly answer any question unless I really understood their pain points? So the needs analysis is, you know, to get beyond the job posting, job posting itself. I have a different phrase for it. I call it the list of the irrelevance <laughs> because, yeah, tangentially connected, but almost everything on that list is, is, is not really part of this day to day of this job. Um, that's not a picture of the job. So. I need to figure out what are the real pain points? What are they experiencing? And that's not something you usually write out for your competitors out on a public posting. So, you know, what, what's going on with you? Or what, what would you like to change? What would you like to solve? Uh, even, even, even why is this position open? The reason the position is open can tell you a lot. Either it's open from uh, a growth standpoint. Uh, we're growing so much, we need to add this role. Fantastic, fantastic. But what does that tell you? they may not have the right support mechanisms in place. If you're used to a lot of support mechanisms, you may not do well in that role. So we have to think about those things. Uh, maybe the person got promoted. Okay. If the person got promoted, what do you think the state of their work product is for that role? Probably pretty good. I, I bet you also they'd like to keep the momentum of their legacy moving forward. So they want you to get in there, shore up and keep everything moving forward to keep their reputation positive. And what's the state of the work product if the person left on their own? Have you ever left a job for another job? You know, turned in your notice? Well, most people have. Uh, now, let me ask you a different question. When was it that you actually stopped doing your current job while you were looking for that new job? Was that two months ago, three months ago? Do your, did, did your boss even realize what was not done? So... If they left on their own, they may have some fire or train derailment about to happen that they don't even realize. You may have to have, do some follow-up questions. A couple important things. Gosh, what have they not seen? We're going to talk more about that as we move forward. Needs analysis will help you understand how to focus your answers so it's relevant to them. 
Customize those work life stories. You know, it says work life stories because maybe I need to talk about a work story with you and maybe I need to talk about a life story. Maybe I need to talk about climbing Half Dome with you out in Yosemite. Maybe that's what's going to set you on fire in addition to seeing how capable and qualified I am. So, uh, yes, focus your stories on what showcases a skill or a certain value or an interest or, or, or somehow would elevate their desire for me. Look and listen and plan for objections. Now, if you've got a few things in your background, you're probably ready for the objections. You probably heard them so many times. It hurts. Oh, so nice to meet you. Come on in da, 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 or come into my Zoom. Blah, blah, blah. And then they, they pick up your resume and they make you watch and they go. So you haven't worked since last year? Just like that. Just like that. <laughs> it's technique, by the way. That's simply to put you on the defensive, to knock you off your soapbox, to make you tell me, explain to me why I just, whatever it was, I just accused you. You've not worked in this industry. You haven't worked in this field. You haven't worked in nonprofit or commercial. Whatever you don't have, you exactly know what it is. You know what they could accuse you of. Overcoming objections is actually easier than you think. First technique or the base technique to keep in mind every time is an agree but disagree technique. So I'm going to find some way, shape, or form to somehow get as close to agreeing with whatever they accuse me of. And then we're going to completely disagree with it next by what I say to overcome that objection. So maybe they go, well, John, you've never worked in nonprofit. <laughs> you know, I haven't. Just like it's a gift from up above. I cannot change the fact that I have not worked in nonprofit. Therefore, I'm not going to even try. I'm going to go like, oh, that's a bonus. <laughs> you know, I haven't. Uh, but I'm sure you're going to see lots of those candidates. Other people are candidates. <laughs> You're always an individual. Oh, I'm going to see lots of other candidates that 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 bring that background to the table. You know what I bring to this opportunity is something very, very different. It's also why I'm going to be most successful to you. It's this, and I go into whatever it is that I think is going to make me most successful. Your job is to overcome the objections and convince them whatever concern they may be thinking about really isn't a concern at all. Now, no buy sign. How do I know if there's a buy sign? They were so nice to me. There's only two buy signs. One buy sign is, gosh, love your background. Love to bring you back next week to talk to Jim, Jack, Jill. Okay, indication that the next interview is going to happen for you. They don't have to promise the day and time yet. They already promised the interview was happening for John. That's enough. Accept the win. That's one buy sign. The only other buy sign is, gosh, we'd, we'd like to move toward offer. And, you know, can I get your references to move toward offer? Sure, sure. Any move toward offer stage means you did win. Quit selling, let them move toward offer, let them make you a good, bad, or ugly <laughs> offer. That's a different uh, thing, whole different video on negotiations. Um, those are the only two buy signs. So if you get to the end of your interview and they go, oh my gosh, Jack, Jim, Jill, but this has been an amazing discussion. You have you have a dazzling background. Uh, some of these places you've worked. Sounds good so far, doesn't it? And then they go, but, you know, we have a few more people to see, um, you know, probably two or three weeks. And plus the holidays are coming up. So you'll probably be into the first of the year. Doesn't sound as good now. That's no buy sign. So as I would say in my in-person lectures, which I don't do too often these days because of the pandemic, I, I might I might say to that person, why would you get up and leave the room? <laughs> I don't mean like sit there so long till they're like uh, security. <laughs> That's not going to help you as well. But, I mean, why would you leave the conversation? Why not engage them and ask them questions, closing questions? So, really, what we're going to do is using closing questions, simply a scary sales term, which means ask for what you'd like and ask for agreement to it. If you do not ask for agreement to it, you did not close. Just asking for what you'd like is a pipe dream. Not going to happen for you. <laughs> they'd like that. <laughs> they didn't ask me for it, but they'd like it. Okay. So what happens in this is they're going to think about the whole decision process, the hiring process as a two-dimensional timeline. They're going to see that timeline toward a finish line, and they're somehow going to imagine you and your value somewhere on that timeline. At the time they're doing that, they're also going to think about what's wrong with you from their perspective. I know that's a scary thing. <gasps> I don't want them to think about what's wrong with me. Actually, you do. You didn't win because you got no buy sign. Therefore, you'd like to poke and figure out why they aren't 100% sold, what's wrong with you, so you can overcome that right now. So, you know, Jack, what have you, what have we, you not heard? Or, or 
what have we not discussed that would help you in your decision process for this role? Now, that's a pretty good one. I like that one. If you've seen me speak before, you know that's not quite enough for me personally. I'd like to amp it up just a little bit more than that. Uh, for myself personally, and what I'd recommend for those that, that have the gumption to do it is, you know, Jack, let me ask you this. What have you, what have you not heard or, or what maybe sh have we not discussed that would help you in your selection of me as the very best individual for this role? I know it says candidate on the screen. I wrote that one a long time ago. You're always the individual. The other people are always the candidates. Notice now I put it up onto a pedestal very up high. I want to be the best to the best. What you need to hear to know I'm the best. What's going to happen on it is, well, I mean, John, you have a great background. In fact, this is this stuff's amazing. I have a feeling you're weak in area A. Fantastic. Let's talk about that right now. You know, you have to overcome that right now and think about if you maybe you maybe you didn't even discuss area A because you were scared. Oh, I've only done two projects. Is area A important? Well, yeah, it's the core of the job. I think if you don't discuss that area, they're not going to hire you. But, but I've only done two projects. Well, it's not confessional. Therefore, I don't have to go, I've only done two projects. When they go, oh, my gosh, you know, that's such an exciting area. You know, I've worked on projects such as this, and I've worked on projects such as that. What would you like to discuss? I didn't have to say it was the only two projects. You need to calm this fear or you'll not get this job. Remember, every single person has gotten a first day, a first chance. So you can too, even in this move. So overcome their objections, uh, do, do, do the whole agenda so that you're on the right roadmap, have your stories ready, understand that you have to meander around the conversation to figure out what's missing, to read the tea leaves of the discussion, to make sure that you leave them without a doubt that you are the very best one. That's what we're after. Let's take one more look in a different way at the uh, self-recruiter interview checklist. This will make you think about all the things we talked about in a slightly different way. Do your full research on the job, the company, the company culture, everything that you can absorb, including I hope that you're reading every word of that website and learning how to copy and paste phrases onto a text document so that you can begin to learn to speak like one of their employers, employees, use their own language against you. It's like, oh my gosh, you fit in so well. I'm like, yes, I do, because I speak just like your people. That's what you can get from this pr proper research. In terms of the job, I'm sure that job posting is one minor way to figure out about the job, but I have a feeling since you think you're qualified, you could probably write a better job description. Put all that nonsense aside, write out the job description you think is right. Maybe glean a couple items off the job posting itself and whatever may be going on as a competitor or two, they'll probably have a much better handle on the job. Do that needs analysis early in the meeting, really before you answer questions. Of course, we told you all about what that was. Watch your body language. Oh, behave. You know, your body language can communicate a lot. Um, in reality, as I've said across many of these Zoom lectures this year, in reality, I'm actually shy and introverted. And this is still what you see here because I've learned to control presentation. So... Controlling presentation can get past an enormous amount of obstacles that you thought might have stopped you before. Dress like you are a success. Gosh, I was in uh, running tights and five-finger shoes and, and, and a compression shirt because I was out doing cardio a little bit earlier. But if I came on this broadcast looking like that, I don't think you'd take my advice. You have to look the part. You have to embody the product. I get to wear jeans and t-shirt in my job, in my work life. I don't care what you get to work in your work life. You have to look like a million bucks right now. Because if you look less than that, your competitor has already beat you. It gets harder and harder. If someone tells you that you can dress down for the interview, oh, thanks, Andre. And then you show up looking like this, like, oh, didn't, didn't, did, oh, you knew you could dress down. Oh, you know, I have another meeting after this one with your competitor probably <laughs> even if your meeting after this one is with your tuna fish sandwich at lunchtime you have another meeting after this there's always a competitor waiting just around the corner to snap up this great product that they see in front of them are you listening i've given you so much to think about today you'll forget the fact that you also need to be actively listening in between all of the lines for clues <clears throat> that's a very very important piece and the entire time you have to be there selling yourself. Yes, you're there to evaluate, but you're there to sell yourself. Now, let's talk about money. Everybody likes to talk about money. 
this one is definitely going to need a little coffee too. So would you like more money? First off, I'll tell you one thing. John Cramp would like more money. By the way, there's nothing wrong with wanting more money. <clears throat> Here's what it comes down to. As an employer, if I go to hire you and I think you want more money, I don't want to give it to you. I don't want to give it to you. I don't want to give it to you. If you need more money, then I try to find a way to give it to you. Try to find a way to give it to you. The want versus the need. So here's where we have to uh, understand some basics. First off, if you like the very best offer, that is the secret right there. Don't arc about money. And my clients will go, but, but, but when do I, but, but. don't talk about money. But, but, but when do I, but, but. is there something unclear here? Don't talk about money. I understand the burning desire to talk about money. You have to get them to fully fall in love with your product. Make you an offer, good, bad, or ugly, doesn't matter. Make you an offer, which is like slipping a ring on the finger. Oh, I get the ring on camera. <laughs> ring on the finger. Once the ring is on the finger, you can tell them they picked out the wrong diamond. I don't know how you got this oval thing here. I'm not an oval. We're going back to that jewelry store. Let's go. Only once the ring is on the finger. So honestly, you get the very best offer by avoiding money like the plague. If you're very, very good, you'll do it. They'll get to the very end and they'll either uh, make you an offer that works or they'll make you an offer that doesn't. And then you start the negotiating. But most times, most people will get caught somehow. Maybe even the first discussion. Oh, what are you looking for financially? They asked me right up front. <laughs> okay. Couldn't sidestep that one. So, so that's a three-part answer. And I'm going to stop any time I can get them to quit questioning me. So the first part is like a horse's tail flapping around to get rid of the flies. You know, you've seen one of those. And I simply go, oh, I'm, I'm very open. <laughs> um, like it's an epiphany. Oh, I hadn't occurred to me. I'm very open. Uh, you know, to me, it really is about finding the right home for my career. And you know what? That's why I'm so excited about today's conversation. Right back to them like a date. It's about them. It's about finding the right home for your career. <gasps> Magical phrase. I'd write that one down. <laughs> Practice it. <clears throat> Surprisingly, that little horse's tail deflection, that cuts off a third of the people that will not be brave enough. Let me grab a little tissue. Will not be brave enough to ask you again, which is pretty darn shocking. Two thirds coming right back after you, probably with a little more helpful, almost like they're they're, they're rolling up the sleeves, coming around your side of the desk. Let me help you with that pencil. Sharpen that pencil. Get a figure that works for you. I, I just need an idea. Just need to know we're heading the right direction. Just need, need something in the ballpark. Liar, liar, pants on fire. They're trying to get you to tell them how little to pay you. That's the question every time. I don't care how they phrase it. How little can I pay you is the question. Anything around money. Do you want to answer that question? I hope you're a little indignant. I'm not, certainly not going to answer that question. So second time around, when they try to get more helpful, um, I have to I have to put a little more firm stake in the ground. I have to go, you know, gosh, yeah, Jim, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure what to say. As I said, I'm very, very open. You know, um, notice I'm going to make a suggestion, but then I have to define the suggestion because each of us will hear the suggestion and have a different framework in our head. Gosh, uh, Jack, Jim, Jill, I, I'd say um, make me the best offer. I'm, I'm sure it'll be fine. Based, of course, on the responsibilities for that role. And, of course, those unique things that I bring to the table. Notice how that has to be separated out into three pieces. I have to define it. I have to tell what the core definition is, but also the icing on top of the cake because I'm not just an ordinary person. I'm the special things that I bring to the table. All of that together, and then I cap it off at the very end with, just make me the best offer you can. I'm sure it'll be fine. By the way, if they were to make you the best offer that they can, I am sure it'll be fine. I'm also very, very sure they will never make you the best offer that they can because virtually everybody lowballs. Just offer them that. See what see what happens. We can, we can always change it. I've been party to so many of those discussions behind the scenes over the years, and it's about that level of non-stress behind the scenes, which is shocking. Well, you know, offer them a little less. See if, see if we get it for a little bit less. Just understand. There's no negotiations until you get that offer in writing. So even if they were to call up and go, oh, John, gosh, we'd like to make you an offer. Ooh. And then they say some stinky number that I'm very not happy with. 
And what they're hearing and seeing is, hmm, oh, oh, now what, what's the start date? As soon as I heard that stinky number, I'm distracting them by moving to start date. Even if I heard the start date, I, I'm going to go, oh, is there a start date? Do you have a start date? Because the moment I'm asking about start date after they've already mentioned the number, they assume that, oh, John must be fine with that number. Okay, well, I never said I was fine with that number. I'm certainly not fine with that number. That number's too low for John. Um, but this will get you past that. Then you need to get it in writing. And yes, you can get every single offer in writing. That is not a question. If you have not gotten your offers in writing before, it's just because you didn't know you could. And you don't need to go, can I get that offer in writing? No, <laughs> of course you can. So there's no question. Um, so when they present you the offer, it's terrible, but I need to get it in writing so I can negotiate. I simply go, uh, oh, and the start date, oh, oh, 24, oh, the 24th works great. Um, um, when would I be able to get that in writing? Would I be able to get that this afternoon? Whenever you ask for something on a timeline, you cannot allow them to answer. You must interrupt yourself and define the timeline. What, they're, well, they're going to get it out to me sometime next week? If they got it out to me this afternoon, maybe I could accept today. <laughs> So I, I've got to get that quickly, especially because I know that's a stinky number. I need to get them to commit, put the ring on the finger so I can renegotiate that stone. Next item on that list, time to get it right. Well, there's really only two timing questions to think about. One of which is if you're doing a physical in-person interview, which isn't so often these days, get into the local area, get near the site 30 minutes in advance, not in their office, not in their lobby, but get to the coffee shop, get to the park bench go over your notes, absorb everything. Also trust that all of the homework you've done up to that point will be ready for you. About 10 minutes before your time, close the book. Just be centered and trust that all of that uh, homework essentially will be available to you in the moment. Then allow yourself just enough time to get through building security and floor security. So you arrive in the office between five and 10 minutes prior to your interview, not one moment before. You have an 11 o'clock interview and you show up at 1035. That is not okay. I don't know what world you're living in. You, you, you have the wrong perspective. Oh, I'm eager. Your 11 o'clock is here. Oh, my day is already out of control. I can't leave you out there 25 minutes. Now I have to put on a happy face and I have to come out there. Oh, hi. Nice to meet you. I'll be out right at 11 or, or just after. I can't wait for a discussion. Oh, you're messing up my day already. Timing to get it right. The other timing issue is being ready to accept the offer. You do not need to wait for an offer to understand whether you're ready to accept it. I think you're pretty sharp right now. I think you could write down three different numbers right now. What's the lowest, dirtiest, stinkiest offer they could ever give me that I really wouldn't like? What's the offer that's at the level of which I, I don't want to losing it? It covers most of my financial pain. I might have to take that offer, write that number down. And then where's the number that you're dreaming about? Not the pie in the sky, but some sort of realistic reach number that you really want. Now you can imagine you just got all three of those offers right now. And you can strategize about what to do next. That's the timing issue. By the way, if you are not going to negotiate, you need to accept that offer now. Step up under the altar. It's like, I do. And then they turn to you. Yeah, can I can I think about this overnight? Can I, can I think about this over the weekend? While I'm standing up on the altar? Not a very happy case. So let's think about that. If you're not negotiating, you need to give them the win. That's where we think about it in advance. Whole time I'm talking about opportunity. And don't forget to ask, ask, ask for the job, which is simple, as simple as, wow, Jack, Jim, or Jill, I'm very excited by our discussion today. What is our next step? Even if you know the next step is to walk down the hall or walk to the next Zoom meeting, you get the answer. They need to hear, ooh, ooh me, 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 me. Here's the real homework, preparing the answers to the questions you might be asked. I mean, you're the specialist in your field. Promote yourself up to, to boss. You need to hire you. What questions would you ask? You write those down. You're, you're the expert there. To your list of questions, we're going to add three self-recruiter questions. These three self-recruiter questions uh, will kind of help round out, you know, all of the thought process. Tell me why I should hire you over all others that I see. It's kind of throwing down the gauntlet. Not likely to be asked it this way, but elements of this answer better be mixed into your other answers. Or I don't think it's going to go really well for you. Uh, tell me why my work life will get easier or better if I hire you. 
definitely not likely to ask you this question in this way, but my gosh, elements of this answer have to be mixed into your answer. And if you were good at giving me this answer, my gosh, I'd hire you tomorrow because it's all about me. It's a date. Don't forget that part. And of course, the last one you really already know, why is it going to be the very best business decision I'll make today if I were to choose to hire you? If you hit those three notes, plus answer the questions that are core for your field, you understand why they're going to want to select you. But if you're jittery or you're not smooth or uh, you don't have confidence when you speak, that comes from lack of practice. Practice makes perfect. Uh, you need to role play this to death. Get with a friend or get with a good coach and practice, practice, practice till we're blue in the face. Now, follow up is extremely important for a, an interview. I have to tell you, absolutely shocking thing to me is how few people actually send thank you notes. Would you like to be a standout? Simply send a thank you note because it's shocking how few. Now, when I teach in-person sessions, oh my gosh, the hands all go up. Oh yeah, I send a thank you, I send a thank you. Somebody in this room is lying to me <laughs> because statistically, it's just a tiny, tiny little percent that send thank you notes. Uh, we, we somehow miss that piece. Um, thank you notes besides saying hey i really do want this job and it's a date it has to be a thank you note um thank you notes can also solve problems so key to this is we need to do a little self-diagnosis as we come out of that meeting that interview uh and and if it's in person we don't go home we, we sit at the nearest coffee shop or park bench or whatever it is or if it's on zoom at home we sit down on the couch and and, and we begin to do this debrief now a debriefing is how an interview feels like an interrogation and cross-examination, a grilling. Yeah, you need to grill yourself about the good, the bad, the ugly. What went well? What do I wish was different? Where did I really stick my foot in my mouth? Oh, what did I miss talking about? The point here is not to beat yourself up. The point here is constant improvement. Recognize what you did well so you can repeat it. Recognize where there was missed opportunities so next time you won't miss it. Uh, realize also what you avoided talking about and realize how you have to speak about those things. Now, the most important question, the one is the one you're going to ask yourself last because it's a little demotivating, but it's very, very important. If they don't move forward, if they don't move you toward an offer, what's the reason? This does not require thought. This is more of like hit the funny bone and get some sort of uh, uh, reaction. Uh, your gut feeling is what we're after. Oh, probably because I'm weak in area A. Now, I saved one of my promotions early in my career with this same exact technique. I was running a number four store in retail for my, my organization. They had 121 stores around the country. Uh, I've got, I've got, I'm in the number four store in the country running a department, but a very, very important department. And it's the number one department in the entire country. So when my store manager ran up to be country manager of Canada, you can imagine John's going, oh, well, I should ascend to the throne and take over this entire store because have you seen my P&L for my department, which is number one in the country? It's pretty amazing. Now, the problem is the hiring was done by two different regional managers, one of which was mine, knew me and knew the chemistry and knew my P&L, which was fantastic. And the other person didn't quite get me, didn't know me. I don't, I don't know about John. P&L, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> and that's what you're hiring about. Um, but I was, this was all before my time in recruiting. And I was still very, very good in conversation. I went in, I interviewed very, very well, even though I didn't know so much of what I was doing. Uh, let me just get rid of this little call that's trying to call me on my watch. <laughs> um, so, so I thought I did pretty well. Then I went back to my retail location. I called my spy right in headquarters. Very good to have a spy in headquarters. I said, oh, yeah, I think it went pretty well. Think it went. No, 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 they're in there arguing about you right now. Something about your vision for the store. I'm like, oh, how did I have an interview to be the general manager? And I failed to communicate my vision for the store because I felt so entitled to the role based on my P&L. And plus, I could see my competitors that were at the lesser, smaller stores that was definitely not capable of running this monster operation. And that's a dangerous place to be because then you underestimate uh, the decision process. So in all that, I realized, oh my gosh, I got to get a thank you note out to counter the fact that they're arguing about me behind the scenes. So 
First thing in thank you notes is please never again for the rest of your life thank someone for their time. You have to be equal, especially in the hiring process. You have to be equal to every other person that you speak with. Uh, I don't care if that's the CEO or the person that cleans the CEO's office. Never speaking up to anyone and certainly never speaking down to anyone. So you have to be equal. So, you know, in all this, you, you're going to thank them for the great discussion, for the insights they shared, not their time. Your time is just as valuable as theirs. Um, and then you move on to a second paragraph, just like I did. In in, in my uh, 20 year ago odyssey, I, I, I shot off this second paragraph going, you know, we didn't have a lot of time to talk about my vision for the store. You know, if you'd like to discuss that, feel free to call me on my cell anytime. Click send. Oh my gosh, bullet point out that vision. They're going to call me in a minute. Never called me. Got the job just like that. Oh, look, look, he has a vision. Doesn't matter what it is. He, he's got a vision. Doesn't matter. Got the job. You do the same thing. You can refer to whatever it is and 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 offer to talk about it. I know you don't want to talk about these things because you feel weak in these areas, but just the confidence of offering it will likely put the concern to bed in many, many cases. Don't forget, your job is to get them excited about you. Make sure that you build the right chemistry through the entire process. Make sure that they feel that. You have to be excited about their, their product, their project, whatever, their brand itself. Um, it's got to some way, shape, or form be about them. But also, you have to be real and genuine. Now, am I being disingenuous right now because I confessed to you a few minutes ago that I'm shy and introverted? I don't appear shy and introverted. Is John being real and genuine? This is really me too. <laughs> so you have to get away from that nonsense, but just give yourself permission to be you, even if it's outside your normal comfort zone. Let's give you some video interview techniques to wrap up today's session. We have a lot of great stuff, but let's not lose sight of the fact that a few years back, some clients were asking me about video interviewing and I'm like, oh no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. I don't even get into it because it's so difficult for most people, but pandemic has forced our hand. So yes, could be an unscheduled call or scheduled or in-person, but most times it's going to be that video interview these days that's going to have to get you over to the finish line. Now, <clears throat> most of us fail to properly prepare in this COVID-19 era for interviewing. Um, I pulled a few things off of uh, the internet so we can see what works or what doesn't work. So I'm going to throw some darts at some stuff I just pulled. Remember, chemistry and confidence is what wins the vote. Do we see it in the visual here? You know what? I'm not even sure this person knows that they're interviewing and they're certainly not interviewing for a sports team. Uh, I, I don't understand showing up to a Zoom call like this if it's an interview. Uh, chemistry and confidence win the race. Do we see it? Do we see it? I'm not, I'm not I, don't, I don't see it. In fact, I can barely see you. All I can actually see is not what's out your window that's blinding me. I need to see you, not the sky. And I certainly don't need to see you hovel down like some submissive whatever chemistry and confidence win the race. Do we see it here? Do we see it here? Actually, I don't see it here. I'm pretty sure this person thinks they convey as confidence, but but honestly, I, I don't need to see up your nose and I don't need to see your ceiling. This just tells me you're ill-prepared for this meeting. Chemistry and confidence win the race. Do we see it? Do we see it? Chemistry, I don't, I don't really feel it, but you know what? I'll give them the confidence vote. Give them the confidence vote. I'll give it to them. I'll give it to them right before I actually take it away. I suspect this person doesn't actually have confidence because of a couple indicators. One is the selection of background image. They've chosen a background image. You might go, well, that's a nice image. It is a nice image, but it's such the nice image, it causes me to constantly look away from you, which says, oh, I can be comfortable here, says you don't have confidence. The other thing is this gigantic boom gaming mic. Oh, but I like to listen to my calls that way. I don't care how you like to listen to your calls. This is presentation. That undermines your confidence. We need to, to get rid of that. Chemistry and confidence win the race. Do we see it here? You know what? I'll give the chemistry vote. I'll give the confidence vote. Um, I, 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 So far, so good. But attention to detail. Let's not let ourselves get upstaged here. I do like this square frame of the room. That works. But this giant picture that we can't see right behind the head causes us to constantly look to try to figure out what it is. Don't be upstaged. Chemistry and confidence win the race. Do we see it here? Do we see it here? I feel the chemistry. I feel the confidence. We're going to we're gonna uh, give the votes here, but we have the same problem of being upstaged. Now, I do like that curved uh, wall. I do like the pictures, but 
it causes me to only try to zoom in to figure out what are those pictures on that wall. And again, it's a distraction because you're being upstaged. Chemistry and confidence win the race. Do we see it here? You know what? I, I feel the chemistry. I, I, I feel the confidence as well. But I don't really even think we need the Princess Leia medium size headphones on. I understand your headphone desire. It needs to go away. It needs to become very, very small. Uh, hopefully earbud style, not even this style. Chemistry and confidence win the race. Well, of course, I see it here. Let me comment about the picture selection. I know this is just a... A, a, a normal picture grabbed off the internet, but they chose something not unlike mine that's a little bit three-dimensional, helps create depth, lift themselves properly. Uh, other than the small headphones, which I don't like, um, this is a pretty sharp presentation of ourselves, and we have to think about that, but don't wear the medium headphones either. Chemistry and confidence win the race. Do we see it here? You know what? It gets both votes. All things being equal, and they never are, this one's the winner. I know it's still a little up, a little too much up the nose, but the framing with the three pillars on the left, the little tiny but large uh, picture that I see a little bit on the right, I can see it, but I can tell what it is. It's not a distraction. This person wins the day. Now, I'm going to show you exactly what creates this visual here today. Um, this is not about being comfortable. Now, this is not where I'm standing, although I'll show you where I'm standing here in a moment. This is my other half's work desk. You know, it's a work from home environment. So they're in the other end of the room or the other end of the house, and they are positioned directly up against the window. Uh, they stare right out that bright window. You know what? I can't do that. That uh, all day long, the lights, hazel eyes wouldn't do well. But that is their normal environment. Uh, they also get lit pretty well from that. You need great light. So that is a good starter. But you may need a couple things. Very likely you're going to need to elevate that computer because the camera's not at the right level. Otherwise, it's back to looking up the nose like this. Well, we don't want to be looking up your nose, so you probably have to elevate the computer. And depending on the time of day or type of day, you may need some sort of a light ring. These light rings, by the way, have adjustments for color tone. So if your camera is a little bluish or a little greenish or a little this or a little that, you can adjust the color so that you come off just right. That's just the start. If you would like to sound great, <laughs> you probably need a condenser microphone. Yep, I know every computer has a microphone now, but that's different than a standalone condenser microphone. This is the microphone I'm speaking on right now. Produces a very different outcome. And yes, just like I recommend here, I am standing up. I can jump up and down to prove it. I'm standing um, you need to stand for your interviews. When you stand, you release the diaphragm muscle across the middle of your body. That allows you to relax your throat, lower your vocal resonance, create more chemistry, even over a Zoom situation. Now, to where I'm standing right now, I'm actually in my bedroom, and I have my ironing board directly up against the side of the bed. I have a series of boxes, just like you see in this visual, elevating the computer. What you don't see in this visual is on top of my laptop itself. I have a separate external camera sitting up there. It's a 4K camera, even though it's not recording 4K right now. It's a very good camera. Uh, so I get lots of that. And then I'm surrounded by light boxes. Now, I mentioned earlier the hazel eyes and sensitive to light. But somehow when I step on stage under those lights, it's a dream come true. And somehow I can trick my brain to accept this blinding light for a short amount of time. But you have to be lit properly all the way around. Let's reverse this, you can see it. I'm actually standing right in front of a wall. I'm in front of a green screen here. I've swapped out the background to create environment. Um, you realize how close I am. I, I literally have about one square foot of space. There you go, there it is, that I can move around it. That's actually helps you because you can leave your feet planted and yet you can have your little bit of normal movement to make you a real person. You want to look great? Make sure that light's all around you. Also, make sure you have prepared for everything. Yep, I have a stool down there. Well, the stool's not empty. It's holding my coffee, and occasionally it's holding my clicker. Um, all those things have to have a place. Uh, so think about learning to, to love this type of a setup for your next interview. 
that is interview intervention. Uh, we have so much coming up for you uh, this next uh, two, this week and next week. This is the job search blitz toward the end of the year. Um, let's get on the website, selfrecruiter.com. Click that calendar tab. We have all my lectures coming up both this week and next week, and we're going to cover every single aspect of job search. We're talking about resume. We're talking about LinkedIn. We're talking about the interviewing itself. We're talking about using social media in your job search. Um, even, even Thursday's lecture for NYPL, which does require advanced signup, that particular lecture is going to be all about using branding components in your small business, some of which of those same elements come back into the interview process. Um, hop on the website, share it with your friends, and uh, don't forget a very special Ask Self Recruiter is also coming up, the Ask Self Recruiter uh, Q&A series. That's a live streaming, send in your questions. We handle them off right off the cuff. Uh, so hopefully you join in. Everything is over at selfrecruiter.com, right under the calendar tab. And we'll see you very, very soon. Take care. Thanks for joining in today.